So yeah, I'm Julia. I'm from Hawaii. Uh, you probably don't believe me because I look like I'm from Nebraska. Uh, but I really am from Hawaii. And this first poem is called My Paradise. My home is Palakaiko, Hawaiian for paradise, rain considered a blessing of the Hawaiian gods, early morning jobs, Manoa Valley mist, rainbows, Roy G. Biv, so low I can run through them. Five in the morning, surf. Locals, turf, not a tourist in sight. I lay back on my board. Cumulonimbus clouds say hi. Humu humu nuku nuku wapawa. I swim by. Turtles shy. Bob up for air, not a care wave swells. I ride into shoal. Stumble out of the ocean board, nearly knocking me over. I stand in the sand up to my ankles, feel like a sunburned Irish refugee. Saltwater eyes, red, make me look stoned. Fifty-two more freckles after my vitamin D-filled morning of waves and wipeouts. Palekaiko is Hawaiian for paradise. Acquaintances inevitably ask, as if to appease the gods of platitudes, um, where are you from? <laughs> their eyes glaze over once the question is asked, having appeased their task of the benign pedestrian exchange. Oh, I'm from Hawaii. Their eyes refocus on mine. I am gazed out like a unicorn, strange, mystical, possibly exotic. They keep their cool while running the gamut of memories. Luau's, Elvis under a palm tree, and a hula dancer postcard they got once from their retired grandmother's vacation. Absurd associations with Hawaii are not the fault of any one individual, but much how Times Square is Disneyland on crack. A tourist zone reinforcing myths of NYC, not the cultural facts. I heart NYC tees, plastic statues of liberty, gyrating plasma beams of MTV. Nothing to do with New York living. Waikiki is also giving plastic lays. Sand in a bottle made in China. Taki aloha print shirts, coconut bras that'll make your tits hurt. Waikiki is the same absurd Disneyland, only with fake hibiscus and sand. Palakaiko is Hawaiian for paradise. I am Haole, Hawaiian for white. I wish to be Hapa, Hawaiian for mixed. Growing up, my world was an assorted plate of Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Pacific Islanders, Samoan, Korean, Hawaiian, Vietnamese, and everything in between. My girlfriends were Hapa goddesses. Black hair like a cooled lava flow, eyes greener than Pololo Valley, curves like a wave on the Banzai pipeline, skin dark as the shadows cast by banyan trees. I stood among them a white wildebeest. <laughs> I would pray for so many freckles it would turn me into a dark deity. Or if I scored one big ass freckle over my entire epidermis, I'd be coffee colored like everybody else. If I was hot, I'd be an amalgam of the world. If I was hot, I'd be a microcosm of what this world is going to be in future generations. But no, not me, the howliest girl in Hawaii. Balekaiko is Hawaiian for paradise, but it is not my paradise sitting in the mezzanine of a Broadway theater. Ornate proscenians, they don't make in this day and age plush seats. Musty smell of history and spirits of artists who came before. Curtain rises, I absorb my heroes on stage, hoping to be there too. One day communal celebration of human experience. Then, autumn air. Light leather jacket. Leaves, patchwork, yellow, orange, greens, like a soft quilt to float on. Up 8th Avenue with your soulmate to the third floor bar you shoot the shit in. Drink post-show explosion of praise and criticism. As the drinks keep coming, the buzzed uptown 2-3 train ride home. That is my paradise. So when I first came, I was so excited to come to New York City right out of high school from Hawaii. But when I got here, the, the thing that I found, uh, the only thing similar was the language and the currency. Uh, so this next is a short, next guy is a short poem about the moment I was dropped off by my parents at Grand Central Station and I was on my own for the first time in my life, and it's called GCS Rookie. I stand in the middle of Grand Central Station's main concourse, glued to the glowing lighthouse clock, my home base beacon. Gray, black, brown coats swirl around me, all prepared to squash smaller fish in the sea with a cold bump. I'm the rookie chump standing in the way, gotta move the workday, can't delay. No aloha spirit, just a stink eye slay. No Hawaiian shirt lacks business guys, only power suits, grimaces, and angry printed ties. I look up to escape this angry movie, making me dizzy. Everyone's so damn busy, driven, focused, power walking with somewhere to go. The metro, which I had yet to learn. Standing there, waiting my turn to ask directions to the six train. I step up to the customer service booth and try to explain that I'm new in town. My eyes open and smiling, his tired dark circles framing his frown to board to give me the subway breakdown. <laughs> Ascertaining I'm a cliche off the bus, doesn't want to fuss. Thousands of doe-eyed little girls ask him every damn day which way to their dreams. 
He points to the green six train subway sign, a bust out a power walk, beeline, feel benign, slouch shoulders, and see confident slim, slap on a new mask of zipped up grim to project. I am not the smallest fish in the sea, so please, pretty please, don't fuck with me. <laughs> We're going to take a little turn left, but you guys are awesome, so we got this. Um, this next poem is called Prognosis. Waikiki Beach, Halakulani Hotel, Christmas Eve, my fifth year on Earth. My dad had the coolest gig posing as Santa Claus, <laughs> riding a hibiscus-covered canoe toward shore. Ho, ho, ho! Melakaliki maka! Tourist kids knock each other over in a flurry of sand, fighting for fake Santa's attention. My dad's fake fluffy beard flaps in the trade winds as buff shirtless elves paddle him in in a chorus of coconut bras with grass skirts strum his welcome. My dad clutches the sides of the canoe to keep steady as it bobs through the waves. Years later, he would clutch the sides of his hospice bed as the waves of morphine rocked him in and out of consciousness, his ribs harboring a football tough tumor that pressed fast forward on his life so that in the span of five months, he went from a hearty 68 to a withering 98 at such an exponential rate that by his last week, he was paralyzed and able to speak. He was my lighthouse beacon, the very reason I didn't weaken when the mist was so thick I couldn't see past my hand. He was my Walt Whitman supreme. So it was beyond a bad dream when the final prognosis came in. He had five months left to live in his skin. I got on the first plane home. United altitude, 34,000 feet. How many more hours until my Hallmark card? The I love you, we'll get through this together moment. But when I arrived home and gave him a hug, my card quickly melted in the sun. He had shut down and was done with connecting to those that loved him and the following months were unpredictably grim. He was thrashing around for an answer, couldn't find a cure for his cancer. I was resentful, I put my life on hold. He didn't seem to notice his tone, eyes cold. The cancer was eating his brain, he was uncontrolled. I couldn't understand there was a finite amount of time. Wanting to leave felt like a crime, yet I could not fathom losing him, so my world felt claustrophobic and dim. I felt selfish in my fears of staying in Hawaii for what felt like five years. Scared of sinking into the island of Oahu. Wind sending trees to envelop my arms, trees pushing my head down under their trunks, shards of rain demanding moss to grow over me. Scared my grief would cause me to eat so much sugar I would explode into a puffy-eyed saddlebag cliche that never left home. Scared I'd feel like the kind of loser freak I felt like as a pale 18-year-old geek. Scared of the color of my dad's cough, the deeper the hue, the deeper I retreated into the unknown territory called, this will not end well. But the day before my dad passed away, I got a call from the Shakespeare Theatre Company in DC. They wanted me to put an audition on tape for the role of Helena in A Midsummer Night's Dream. My dad was laying in the living room in his hospice bed. He was in the moaning stage. It was nonstop. The only place in the house you couldn't quite hear him was the upstairs bathroom. So I got my little camera and set up shop right outside of the shower as a tropical bright green Madagascar lizard that I had named Bert watched me from the ceiling. As I tried to say Shakespeare's lines earnestly to the camera, my dad moaned along as if accompanying me. Hi, my name is Julia Ogilvy, and this is for the role of Helena. How happy some or other some can be. <laughs> Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. <laughs> What of that? Demetrius thinks that. <laughs> so he will not know what all, but he do know. Ah, uh, I thought, well, that's as good as it's gonna get. No one could never get the part. I sent it off into the ether. That night, I held my dad's hand as I fell asleep, which looked like a parched yellow letter that contained 68 years of his life. The next morning, I woke up and noticed his chest wasn't moving, which took me a while to notice, given the morphine had shallowed his breathing. In fact, my mother and I weren't quite sure if he'd passed away. Our professional caretaker, Martin, a skinny pencil who was one day shy of his 21st birthday, this caretaking job his first, confessed that his instructor had skipped the day of training where you learn how to use a stethoscope to hear a heartbeat. He was embarrassed as he nervously tried to take my dad's pulse and sure of how to ascertain the needed information. My mother ran to get her compact mirror and put it up against my dad's mouth to see if any fog showed up in the mini mirror. There wasn't. My dad's mouth hung open like a cave. My mother looked up at me and awkwardly giggled, I think he's dead. 
Martin said, can I get you anything? My mom and I said simultaneously, beer. It was 9 a.m. and the baby had been born in reverse. And the next day, I found out I got the job. Wow. This is from the point of view of being nine years old when I first came to New York City with my mom, and it's called Frozen Wagner. <laughs> Flying high in the sky, mommy and I, 12 hours straight shot, flight landing in Newark International Airport. Street level baggage in hand, automatic doors open to Jersey Air. We jump into a taxi and we're on our way, laying eyes on New Jersey for the first time. <laughs> Factories tower over the freeway like napping disgruntled dragons. A giant howly face smiles down at me with a blinding white grin selling gin. Mom says the big sign is called a bill board. Just as foreign as the gray musty haze gilding buildings. Sharp points of Manhattan poke through the clouds. If they say architecture is like frozen music, then these buildings score the sky like oh, 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 oh. Frozen Wagner. Severe, yet glistening like the Queen Atlantic Ocean's prized tiara. Over the bridge and onto the island of Manhattan, we lurch to a stop, squeeze safe into a hotel room. Deluxe view of a brick wall. The next morning, we run up the backbone of Lady Liberty, glide down the rails of the Guggenheim slinky. Mommy says MoMA's the best. Mr. Pollock's painting entitled 1 No. 31, 1950 glues me to the bench. How does that brilliant mess know my address? <laughs> Elevator rockets me up to Eagle Eye Empire View, surveying my Tetris turf. These succinct structures sinking me up to a city sparkle. I just want to surf it. Strutting my Roy G. Bibb style through Times Square like it's no big deal. Cause my mom and I are walking down the street. Aloha NYC, I'm here for a week. Rainbow geek, arching from Milwaukee to Manhattan, expanding to speak. A beam, arch, stretch over Hollywood Boulevard, the Grand Canyon Mountains with the president's car pulling over St. Louis Arch. DC, Zabe Lincoln is staring me down, letting me write smack here in Midtown. So check out my Roy G. Bibb style, busting out a crooked felt girl smile cause I'm a newfound New Yorker. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks so much.